Okay, so uh, the panel with my distinguished guests, Ken McLeod, Diane Musha Hamilton, and Shinzen Young. The title of the panel is the, basically the topic of the whole conference, so it's the emerging face of Buddhism, or as I've been taught in the southern accent, Buddhism. <laughs> I'm learning, preparing to go That's Texas. Good. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the 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 topic is vast, and we, we we took a few minutes to sit down and decide where we want to go with this. Uh, and just to give a few introductory remarks <clears throat> to introduce the topic, uh, Buddhism is of course a, a, an ancient spiritual tradition. And according to some concepts we use in the, in the Western uh, uh, scientific kind of thinking, religion. And it has been a global religion, as pointed out before, uh, for a long time. Although the meaning of global now, uh, due to the technological and transportation uh, advances, uh, has somewhat <coughs> shifted. Uh, however, as it uh, comes to the West, so to speak, uh, it, has to, it has to negotiate both, both cultural and uh, uh, worldview gaps, moving from traditional to modern and beyond, and also moving from Eastern customs to Western, somewhat more individualistic uh, ways of living our lives and thinking about our spiritual practice not necessarily inheriting our spiritual orientation from our parents or other ancestors. Uh, in such a situation, uh, there is also a shift in the lifestyle of those who practice Buddhism or who tend to identify as Buddhists. In the traditional East, it would be monks, uh, especially scholar monks on one side, yogis, on the other side, and lay people visiting temples, burning incense, worshiping Buddhas and ancestors, on yet another side. In the East, uh, sorry, in the West, uh, most of the practitioners don't neatly fall into any of these categories necessarily. We have professors on universities that replace uh, scholar monks. We have uh, meditators of all possible ilk uh, replacing the yogis, uh, <clears throat> we don't use caves anymore so much, <clears throat> or actual trees to sit under. And we have, of course, a, a laity, so to speak, that is not so much uh, faith-based, but more curiosity-based, uh, information-based. So there is a definite shift in, uh, in, in the way Buddhism <coughs> is practiced, and especially the way it is integrated into our lives. And the third point, uh, everything, uh, everything that I've mentioned so far is happening at a point where the contact between different religious, specifically contemplative traditions, is more immediate, uh, more transparent, more public, not based so much on uh, only meetings of individual teachers that represent lineages and traditions as in the ancient world. But there is a discourse, there is an, uh, a public sharing of ideas, a public comparing of techniques, etc., etc., so that it's much more easy even for uh, non-experts, meaning those who are not full-time devoted to these disciplines and, and knowledges, to basically slide from one tradition to another without feeling a, a, a shock. And this is also a specific uh, thing that is perhaps uh, unique for our time. These all three points, uh, I find, are generalizations that are useful. However, these generalizations play in a very uh, uh, interesting, poignant, and somewhat surprising way uh, when it comes to real-life situations. And we have agreed to start from our real-life uh, experiences as learners and students, practitioners and teachers uh, of Buddhism in, in this culture at this time and to see how our own process has uh, 
basically not just reflected but exemplified an emergent dynamic, uh, uh, which is the topic of this uh, panel discussion. Okay, so enough with the intro. Uh, any of you guys feeling <coughs> full of... Shinsen, why don't you start with your... <laughs> <laughs> My finger pointed to you first. I think you did, okay. <laughs> Let's uh, click on the draw. In, uh, in following up on Hokai's uh, introduction here, uh, faced with a number of uh, factors, probably the most significant thing I did in uh, developing uh, teaching models was the development of a private practice model. Uh, I gave a presentation for this in, uh, on this in 1995 at a teacher's conference, uh, which I started off by saying, you know, I meet with people, I discuss the Dharma, we study text, we do this, and they pay me for it. And the, there's just shock went through the room. Uh, and then a whole bunch of Vipassana teachers came up to me afterwards and whispered in my ear, we're doing basically the same thing that you are, but we can't talk about it. <laughs> uh, from, uh, <clears throat> but this is one of the models that is developing, and it's not just within Buddhism. And it, in a certain sense, it represents the last of the professions to leave the monastery. The, originally, the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, they were all in the monasteries. And one by one, they left the monastery and became professions. Spiritual direction, if you use the Catholic term, spiritual guidance, whatever, is arguably the last profession to leave the monastery, and that's something that we're finally moving out of medieval times. Now it's your turn. <laughs> okay, so on the issue of economics um, and the Dharma, um, I think it's, if you think about it, it's pretty straightforward. We don't want these practices to be denied to anyone. We want everyone to have access to uh, the best instruction that they can have. As long as that happens, um, I don't think it really matters whether it's dana or a payment, uh, uh, or even a large payment. Okay? 50,000 a week. <laughs> uh, whatever, as, as long as we make sure that everyone on the planet that wants it can get it, and that our uh, payment structures don't in some way inhibit um, uh, equal access to the best teaching. As long as that's, as we assure that, does it really matter if, if we set a, a, an actual charge, uh, even a large charge under some circumstances, as long as that we that money is being used or something is being done to make sure that everyone can get it. Um, so I don't think that there's some, something evil about charging for it, personally, as long as that... Such ethical... a relief after doing this for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, my idea was, well, let's be, let's be creative. Um, what are the problems that people have? Well, they might not be able to afford it, they can't travel, they can't... Um, leave their families. So, um, well, is it feasible to bring, uh, the, uh, to bring retreats to people's homes via telephone? When you first think about it, it's like, wait, my house, telephone, meditating, I, I heard, doesn't compute. I heard you, you, that you do this. And I just couldn't believe it. It made no sense to me whatsoever. And yet, whenever I've talked with people who've actually participated, they find it very effective. How did you evolve this? I just, it was a crazy idea that I didn't think would work either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as with many of the ideas I eventually used, suggested by a student. Um, so I decided, well, let's just try it. I mean, can't hurt to try it. And it worked like a charm. It's counterintuitive because everybody thinks, it's like, wait, my house? That's what I have to leave in order to meditate. Um, it's only going to be four hours long. 
there's not going to be a community around me, okay? It's telephone. It's like, what? What is it? Like a speakerphone and headset? Yeah, speakerphone and headset. How do I uh, afford it? Well, I'll get cheap Skype or, you know, whatever. And it just totally doesn't compute. But when we actually did it, it worked. Uh, now, does it have all the great features of intense residential retreat? No. But... Um, the, the business model is so good, we charge 20 bucks. The business model is so good that we can give unlimited full scholarship indefinitely to anyone who wants it. Um, so that's technology. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's not a residential, and no, I'm not saying it's a replacement for that. But it does pretty good, and you don't even have to leave your house. So that's what I meant by, well, let's just try out of the box things. Yeah. Diane, what about you? So, Diane. Well, I'm, I'm also doing a very similar thing. I'm, I have a every morning koan study from 8 to 9 o'clock, and I see all my students for 10 minutes over Skype, and they pay for koan study. And I also do a, a weekly telecourse, and we have what's called the V Temple, which is one day a month. We actually do a full day retreat if you belong to the course, and we, do, we get on the phone and we use the Maestro software so I can break people into small groups for discussions with the Maestro software and we just do a day of sitting um, with three talks and Q&As during the course of that, which I charge for. But I want to kind of, when I made that comment about $50,000, I was actually speaking from experience because my, my teacher um, is, has always pushed my uh, boundaries in terms of my own discomfort and when he started charging to do a big mind session with him for one week fifty thousand dollars for five people so he would generate two hundred fifty thousand dollars I was pushed way out of my comfort zone in terms of what I thought was okay and it was really interesting because I'm okay with people giving and uh, doing it for free and I'm okay with making a moderate living but I noticed all of a sudden I I had a big boundary around where I thought my own internal limit was. So I had to really, really look deeply into that question, particularly in American culture, which there's so many pockets of such affluence that he actually didn't struggle to fill those retreats. And his, his, you know, he'd worked for many, many, many years practically giving away the Dharma. And what I saw was that I think that uh, my own issue is not about the amount so much, but just the way in which, you know, greed, anger, and ignorance were still subject to. And those are powerful energies. And so in a certain way, when we renounce sexuality and when we renounce income and we, when we renounce materialism, we free ourselves of having to work with the corrupting, the corrupting uh, quality that can come from that. So it's a very deep yoga to work with a lot of money and to be willing to integrate it. And I think it's necessary um, and it's appropriate to our time and it has its challenges. Was there something built into that organization to assure that people that could not afford, would have access to uh, equal high always. quality? Yeah, yeah, always. There you go. I, I want to bring up another yeah. economic point, <clears throat> and that is the effect of the increase in productivity in the society on the cost of practice. Mm -hmm. Now, this was developed in the 1960s by an economist called Baumol. Very simple. Well, what was the name again? Baumol, B-A-U-M-O-L. And in Mozart's time, you had five violinists playing a Mozart quintet. And at the same time, you might have five carpenters, and they could build, say, a house in three months in, in that period. Fast forward to 200 years later, it still takes five violinists the same time to play the quintet. But those five guys can now build three houses in the same time or whatever. And the result of that is that the relative cost of the violin can quintet, either to play it or to listen to it, is much higher mm -hmm. right. than the cost of houses. And we talk about renunciation and so forth, but most people today live at a comfort level that was only available to royalty in the time of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And so when people talk about renunciating, renunciating in our lives has actually cost a lot more than it did in the time of the Buddha. And I don't see this aspect being talked about at all. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it also comes uh, 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 to the support of teachers, the creation of centers, as Rohan was talking about, the actual, because you cannot raise productivity when it comes to meditation. It takes a certain amount of time. It's like playing violin quintet. Mm -hmm. And 
the consequence of that is the actual cost of dharma is steadily increasing in the same way that medical costs are. And I don't see this factor being, um, this influence being factored into people's thinking at all. And I think it is going to affect the emergent face of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now, these, these economical considerations certainly play out in uh, the way people approach the Dharma, right? As you have said. Sometimes with uh, resistance, sometimes with uh, excitement. How do students treat the issue of money in your experience? Well, this is where it gets, it does get interesting, and, and uh, I've, I've seen a change in the time that I've been practicing from making scholarships available and, and work trades to, to starting to see that, that issue of when you give value, you actually get value. So I've seen people change their mentality around actually asking for people to make a significant contribution so that they have a significant experience. And that sometimes, I don't know if this is your experience, and we struggle with it a little bit, is it's very tricky in the spiritual world in the sense that sometimes the sort of generosity tends to attract some people who are aimless and having a hard time in their lives focusing. And so we find that our center sometimes, we actually uh, were a little bit enabling of people sometimes not learning how to take a seat in their lives, if that makes sense. And I notice that I struggle with that a little bit. So one part of me has the impulse of, of receiving everyone, and the other part of me feels like if I'm not tougher, that I basically am playing into a thing that's creating suffering. So it's, I find that dynamic one that's challenging. Well, one of the things that I've wrestled with, uh, I read a book called uh, Better Together. Mm -hmm. It's by the same people that wrote Bowling Alone in America. Bowling Alone. Uh, one of them is Putnam, is the sociological research. And they came to the conclusion that there are four things that make vibrant communities, or three. Face-to-face -face meetings, mm -hmm. uh, which is somewhat facilitated by technology like Skype or so. Um, the rank and file can move into positions of leadership, and that's another whole aspect that we need to talk yeah, about. Yeah, that's a big one. And the third one is that vibrant communities uh, form when the community makes demands on the individual, not when the community does things for the individual. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to Kennedy's, ask not what your country can do for you, right. but what you can do for your country. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, I have been astonished uh, in the last couple of years by a group of students who came forward and volunteered to do an extraordinary, I mean, thousands and thousands of hours of volunteer work on a particular project for the, for the website. I mean, really thousands of hours all over the world. Uh, people want to participate, and one of my challenges coming from the private practice model I originally uh, developed is to create opportunities for participation uh, and uh, so that people can really pour their energies in. And, and when I think of working with younger people, that is the major thing that I, I'm, I'm really actually quite stuck on, is creating opportunities where they can pour their energy in, because that's, that's what I did when I was that age. That's what people want to do, so that they can really start, feel that they're building and creating something that is of value to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. How do you handle that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Little related, but a little, uh, little different. Uh, a question that I get asked a lot is, um, how do you do it? <laughs> uh, meaning, um, I've never had a day job. I've, I'm 68 <laughs> years old, and um, I've done nothing but full-time uh, meditation teaching my entire life. Um, so I get to ask this question frequently. So I would, I would like to share that with people. Um, the, um, once again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to sort of figure it out. Um, you, um, if you are uh, willing to have a quasi-monastic lifestyle, meaning you're not necessarily a, a celibate renunciate monk, but you're, you're not raising a family. You're not, you do, you're not gonna have kids. Uh, you're not gonna have a family to support. Um, if you have a simple lifestyle, and um, you said, well, how do the students relate to money in my experience? Uh, in my experience, the students relate to money 
um, in a very simple way. If I deliver the goods, they are very generous with Donna. Uh, in other words, if, if people are getting tangible benefits in their life and it's, uh, it's really working for them, I don't have to get up and give a Donna pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, I'm delivering the goods mm -hmm. as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm competent. And um, so if you develop competency, I know many of you would like to teach. Uh, if you develop competency, if you get good at it, um, and if you live a, a really simple lifestyle, mm -hmm. you can live on just Donna alone mm -hmm. uh, in this culture. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to have a family, um, that's probably not going to work. Then you may need to um, charge significantly. Mm -hmm. um, and you may need some sort of cachet, like a, a therapist license mm -hmm. or something like that to work within the institutions. But the amazing thing is at this point in history, um, I, I have psychiatrists, MDs, that are getting doctor's fees and getting insurance and working inside large institutions that simply are teaching mindfulness techniques. Mm -hmm. What I teach for nothing. Mm -hmm. They're getting a doctor's salary for doing because they've just seen that this works better than what they, uh, and no one's objecting because everybody's, they're making their doctor's salary, the patients are getting what they need, and so it works. But, but this leads us into another aspect of uh, the emergent face of Buddhism because uh, I've seen it elsewhere. A lot of the technologies which were exclusively in the spiritual and religious area are now being taken into all kinds of other areas of, of the culture. Uh, I, I have, and I know other people have, have been consulted by the military uh, about mindfulness and its applications in various contexts in the military. You've worked, and many people have worked with the medical profession, the psychotherapeutic profession. There's a lot of people who have used management, um, mindfulness and other Buddhist perspectives in management consulting. And so we're seeing this technology going out into the world in a very, very different way. Uh, and it, it, it creates some challenges as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you mentioned leadership a little while ago. The medical model uh, for training people is see one, do one, teach one. That is, you, once you've seen a procedure, you're qualified to do it yourself. Once you've done it yourself, you're qualified to teach it. Now, this, from my training in traditional Buddhism, this isn't quite right. <laughs> But actually, I would so disagree. We've been experimenting with the notion that um, people can start teaching more or less right off the bat. Um, specifically, <coughs> uh, my colleague Soryu um, yes. has developed this I've Mind the Music program mm -hmm. where we use music as the basis for mindfulness training. And he's this genius with kids. And he had the temerity to try um, the notion that not only is he going to be teaching 16-year-old uh, kids uh, how to meditate while they're listening to music, but that as soon as they learn that technique, they have to teach another kid. As soon as they learn it. And it's part of the class, and mm -hmm. it's actually worked fine. That's now good. we've got kids teaching adults how to meditate. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, oh, it's like, great. so I'm, I'm not entirely sure that, the, that it's 20 years of practice or whatever and then you can teach. I'm not entirely sure that we can't start people teaching much, much quicker yeah. uh, as an experiment and yeah. it either works or it doesn't. Yeah, yeah I think that, that really, that, the I mean, I'm living it too and wondering about it because how I was trained in such a traditional structure with the teacher on top and nobody else and that it took years and years and years to be empowered. And then when you were empowered, basically everyone else in the Sangha's job was to kill you. And if you su survived, then you got to teach. That was kind of, that's kind of the model I grew up in. <laughs> that's sort of... It's just a pretty, pretty bloody environment. Yeah, it was pretty bloody. <laughs> 
But you know, uh, Ken, Ken made a really interesting point from a developmental perspective that I think is worth considering. I like what you're saying, because I think that feels actually more natural in a certain way to me. But also, he made the point that if you look at it from an uh, ego development perspective, and everybody here has been you know, moving, you've been growing in terms of your identity and your worldview, that this really top-down relationship of teacher to student in that really powerful Asian submission model comes from the ethnocentric meme of development in which the human challenge at that point was to actually organize itself. It created an authority. God was an authority. The priest was an authority. The institutions helped to actually uh, uh, socialize this, if you will. And then as human culture kept moving and we moved through a kind of rational materialism of the Enlightenment, and then most importantly through pluralism, which in, and the tremendous relationship to the subjective mind, to psychology, to individual experience, to the moment where everyone has their own opinion, to, to recall this morning, that once we've moved through that, the submission model is actually entirely archaic. Because you, everyone in our culture has, been, has grown up in a grade school where they've been asked, what do you think? What's your point of view on this? And they've been tested in terms of their willingness to actually have a perspective. So then, much later in life, when you're a young adult, you enter into a monastery, go back to that position of not having an opinion for a very long time, and sort of actually set aside everything you think and feel, which at some point there's always a backlash to that in my experience. So I, I always found that critique to be really quite compelling, which is why in, in my own experience I'm really experimenting with that whole notion around how teaching can happen. And it's hard when you haven't been trained that way. This is a beautiful actually passage from a, from a more form-oriented discussion right. with money and technique and distribution to a more content. Yeah. Oriented discussion. Yeah. Now let's let's talk more about authority, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the 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 authority difference, differential. Okay. Let's talk about power. Let's talk about mutuality in let's the teacher-student relationship and mm -hmm. in our communities. How has that shifted in your experience from what it used to be to what it's becoming? It's becoming something new, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have centers in U.S. who who vote their teachers into positions of, <laughs> of power, right? Mm -hmm. After but, having but, certain negative experiences, that's, that's et cetera. Not, <laughs> that's, that's not you and the mission. There are Christian congregations which did that yes, long, long ago. But it's new in Buddhism. Yes. Yeah. And then specifically to, to see while certain deep features of experience, we, we, we tend to call spiritual, mm -hmm remain sturdy and, and resilient over time. And we may say, essentially, not much has changed for seekers from old China or India and, and, and the modern world. There are certain psychological, specifically identity structures, that have shifted tremendously. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean in the relationship of, of, of student and teacher? And, and how does that work out in, in actually teaching techniques, in, in guiding people. Of course, you know, it's very individual and idiosyncratic to a certain extent, but, but there must be certain features that you have observed. Well, I, I want to pick up on something that Diane said, because uh, I've observed exactly the same thing. That, and I experienced it myself, that when I be, entered into Tibetan training, and I trained very traditionally, and, um, living as a not, I wasn't a monk, but in the retreat, it was in a monastic setting. Mm -hmm. And when I came out and came to Los Angeles, uh, I was in my late 30s, uh, chronologically. Spiritually, I was arguably somewhat mature, because I'd had all this training. But sociologically, and professionally, and emotionally, I was still 21, 22, or mm -hmm. something like that. And I had a lot of growing up to do. Mm -hmm. And I have observed uh, that anybody who engages the traditional Asian models regresses psychologically. Right. And I think I, yeah. and, and there's a I huge think. backlash yeah. from that. Yes. One of the things it always at some moment. Yeah. So one of the things that I try to do in my own work is uh, even though I would structure retreats somewhat, you know, the uh, residential retreats uh, with set meditation peers and so forth, so I've moved away from that now, um, I would try to treat teach uh, treat people as adults. And I remember uh, I had invited a, a colleague to attend one of my retreats and said, well, 
What are people doing jogging and reading and things like that? And no, I was letting them manage their own time. When they meditated, they really meditated. Mm -hmm. And that was good. And she acknowledged that that was actually happening. Mm -hmm. But there was this difference coming from these uh, models where you have, as you said, this very hierarchical thing. And I've, what I find is that I have a very different kind of relationship with my students than I had with my teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, I, I think the power discussion is a really, really important one and one that really needs to be unpacked because, in, again, in a, in a traditional model, the power is imbued in the teacher. But the power is not simply the power of dharma as it's taught, or, and maybe even more importantly, the power of transmission. And the teacher's job really is to help cut away what is manifesting in your body, mind, behavior that's just keeping you from seeing true nature. That's the power that you want to give a Zen teacher, to keep you know, cutting that away. And, and that by giving your teacher power, by joining your mind to the, power, to the power of the teacher's transmission, you have that experience. That's the direct mind-to-mind -mind transmission. But that power is often conflated with the power of running an organization, Mm. with the power of telling you about your love life, mm. with the power <laughs> of determining how money is allocated and spent. So it's almost like the family temple of Asia gets transplanted here. And in fact, you know, it may be that you have an extremely powerful transmission, but that your leadership in an organization is not particularly well developed. And so unpacking the whole power discussion becomes very important. What is my power in relationship to your life? My, the only power I want in relationship to your life is to give it back to you. Mm -hmm. That's all I want, mm -hmm. is to give it back to you. And I think sometimes that gets conflated, where you're organizing around the transmission, I end up wielding power in your life that in fact I probably shouldn't be. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a very important and deep well, uh, unpacking that needs yeah. to happen in this culture. We've started doing it, and some of the intensity gets lost. I think that, that when we get a little bit more democratic that you know there's a there's a force and there's an intensity when you practice in those kind of strong hierarchical tainer, containers well, I'm going back to something that's written in the 15th 16th century in Tibet uh, because in, in the Tibetan tradition you have this uh, notion of Samaya uh, which is a very powerful relationship between teacher and student and the way that it is that many people understand it is that you have to do whatever your teacher tells you in every aspect of your life. Right. It's obedience to your teacher. And uh, what Tulak Treng was, uh, Sarah, what, when, did, when was he writing? That's, thank you. Uh, <laughs> she, know, she knows everything. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. He, he, he says very specifically in his commentary on uh, one of the major uh, practices in the Tibetan tradition, this only applies to your spiritual life. Hmm. So I think I agree with you that what's happened in the cultures is, is that a lot of that stuff is conflated and we just absorb that right. coming to the West. And we not, not, I think we have to go back to what it actually meant originally, that in the area of spiritual life, there is an authority structure and it's appropriate to some extent because there is a transmission. Mm -hmm. And as you say, I agree with you, and Thich Nhat Hanh says the same thing, that the function of the teacher is to plant the teacher in the student. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, mm -hmm. but, and, but to separate out everything else mm -hmm. uh, for the appropriate functioning in our society. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I see a lot of Buddhist institutions struggling with that transition. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shenzhen. I think they've said it. <laughs> <laughs> no further okay, comment. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> now let's move to something even more challenging, a little bit, perhaps. Uh, Cross-fertilization. Talk across lineage. Among Confu lineages? Confusion, conversion, collision. Uh, perfection. Perfection. Uh, this is something that's happening in, in, a, in, in a new way. Again, not for the first time. We've seen it happen in India. We've seen it happen in Tibet with the Rime uh, eventually. We've seen it happen in China with the various classification and, and, and unifications, and unifications, influences. 
even in Japan, that ended up the most sectarian. Historically, in the, in, in the, in the Mid Ages, there was a lot of people studying with various schools and lineages and teachers. The way it happens nowadays, it seems to be a little bit different. Yeah. Well, I want to pick up something that Ethan said uh, yesterday, which I think pertains to this. Um, when, you, when you get a great range of choice, and you can pick whatever you do, there's a danger of devel developing superficiality. Yes. And that's something um, I, I would really like to have seen that topic explored more, because I think that is an issue that we're going to have to deal with um, as Buddhism continues to mature. Uh, that, I th from my perspective, I think the cross-fertilization is extraordinarily rich, and I'm very happy to see it for several reasons. One, it breaks down sectarianism. Uh, I, I, I remember Dr. Ratnasara, who used to live in L.A., coming to my teacher, and uh, he's a very learned Sri Lankan monk, and he came to see Kala Rinpoche and trotted out some of the 37 factors of enlightenment. <laughs> and he said, in our tradition, we have this, and like the five hindrances or something like that, or, or the um, five powers and so forth. And Kala Rinpoche used this stuff like the back of his hand, and he trotted out the second one, the second set of them. And Dr. Ratnasara looked at him and said, you, you know this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there are the, these terrible misconceptions about each other. And I think it's wonderful that that has been broken down. Yeah. And there's real communication and an enrichment of various traditions. Uh, at the same time, I think from a student's point of view, it's probably bewildering. Like, because, you know, when you only have one thing to practice, you're only given one choice, then you know what to practice. But when you have to choose yourself, and I think this is part of modern culture, mm -hmm. you have to develop a much deeper relationship with what your intention is in practice to know how to choose. How have you handled this? Well, I, I have a couple... Because you've trained in Zen and Theravada very deeply. Actually, all, all three. Oh, yeah, I yeah, sort yeah, of you're... reverse Buddhist history. <laughs> <laughs> I started with Shingon uh, in Japan. Um, not, I'd never abandoned anything. In fact, the Shingon, someday we can talk, has actually <laughs> very much influenced my formulations. But I started with Japanese Vajrayana. Then um, I um, went, I did Zen and continue to do Zen, actually. Yes. Um, but then when I encountered Vipassana coming back here, I saw, well, this is the most, um, the most malleable for Western culture, etc. Yeah. So I, I, I teach essentially. I would say uh, uh, I, I teach. Uh, I work within the noting tradition from Mahasi Sayadaw. Yeah. So I've taken that as sort of the apparatus. Yeah. But where my noting system culminates is the expansion contraction version of. Uh, of the activity of the Dharma according to Sasaki Roshi. Yeah. And the way I have people work with the three senses is somewhat colored by the, uh, by the Shingon uh, yeah. uh, idea of um, the three mysteries and so forth. Yeah. So I actually sort of have a, um, uh, I, I found that it would it is actually possible to mount the a Zen teacher's paradigm within the um, practice structure coming from Burma. So that's, I guess that's, that would exemplify the, um, uh, what's happening now is that you've got a Japano-Burmese <laughs> fusion created by an American Jew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll take one of those. <laughs> it's so. sounding awfully like restaurants I go to in Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, see, my, my way of thinking about this is I like to, um, uh, I think of my job as not to teach people a certain way to practice, but to t teach people to be comfortable at anyone's retreats. Mm -hmm. So good. I emphasize what I consider to be the common denominators of all practices that are Buddhist oriented. I emphasize concentration, sensory clarity, equanimity. Then I ask people to see how um, this teacher is teaching you those three things mm -hmm. and how this teacher is teaching you those three things mm -hmm. so that they can, uh, so that we separate out, uh, we, what, uh, 
I can outsource things to other teachers because uh, they see the commonality mm -hmm. in what everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that I try to deal with this is sort of like, there's lumpers and splitters, and I try to show people how they're, in a sense, lumped, so they can see that the same core skills are, so I don't think of transmission, I think uh, I'm a coach, mm -hmm. and I, I give people skills. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna learn the same skills, whoever you go to, but it's gonna be presented with a different style and a different structure. Then the other thing is, I've found that some people are naturally poly-spiritual, and some people yeah. are naturally mono-spiritual. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they have to, they find out which one they are, mm -hmm. um, and then they either just stay with one thing and auger into that, mm -hmm. or they're able to graze without getting indigestion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> my, my teaching's not quite as uh, vivid and esoteric and fantastic as yours. It's, it's more mundane, but I, I teach the, the fundamentals of uh, sitting, shikantaza, and simply trusting that with the right posture, the right quality of attention, that what needs to arise arises and learn how to be fully present to whatever arises, both on the cushion and in your life, as the fundamental. And then I'm actually very concerned with the heart and with generating compassion and uh, uh, love and we do a lot of work interpersonally with one another because it, it ma I think that probably that's my being a woman that really affects that I care a lot about the relational field and how people are, are interacting with one another and because of my early upbringing in the out of doors and in the the canyons and the mountains of Utah I'm naturally very attracted to earth-based practices and energetic work from a shamanic perspective so every year we do a retreat in nature where we work with uh, shamanic wisdom and and also just because in the de, in the developmental schema once again that what happens when human humans start to get to this second level of development according to uh, Claire Graves and Don Beck that actually the purple the shamanic 20,000 years ago in human history actually becomes reactivated so shamanic understanding comes back online and that feels very important to my own work right now so cool. you know yeah it's cool <laughs> Thanks, yeah. And I work with the integral model, so I tend to work with a lot of people who are familiar with, we, you know, I call it I Zen, you know, we're doing integral Zen and everybody says, what's integral Zen? And I say people who like integral, who want to sit, <laughs> is basically what it is. So, yeah, please. What's the question? I don't know. <laughs> I have no Move idea. On. We'll, we'll go for some questions from, from the audience, but uh, one more thing. If, if this audience was the, the, the face of, uh, not the emerging face, but the face of emerging Buddhism, uh, what would your advice is, one, two, three points, to this audience be, like, if you guys want to make it, if you want to be a successful emergent Buddhism, take care of this, this, and this. I'm going to defer to age here. <laughs> if, you know, if, if yes. these guys had no guidance but those basic three points. Yeah, Pretty, uh, first thing that pops into my head is practice, practice, practice. 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 <laughs> 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 the three things that popped into my head are what he said. <laughs> But, but actually, let me just add something to it, which is that the, the, the natural awakening of the Bodhi mind, the natural impulse to seek, is so precious, and any time you feel it, cultivate it. Because what you said about how you've lived your life is also how, how I've lived my life, with a very, very early, deep, you know, um, longing deep longing to awaken, which even though I didn't take the path and I became a lay person, I practiced the entire way. And I found that when I entered the judiciary or when I was working with people, that my dharma was, there was a place for it. There was a place when I was teaching judges and lawyers to work with what I already had realized at that point. So your practice and your life are one and the same. 
you know, and, and not, to, not to ever make the split that somehow you practice and give up with your life or vice versa. You just keep working it, you know, so, yeah. Thank you. Your question reminds me of a time when I was at Kala Rinpoche's monastery in Sonoda. <clears throat> and this person showed up who had driven up this extraordinarily narrow road all the, with a caravan. And if you know the hills of India, towing a caravan is like mind-boggling. And he came and joined our classes, and he just went on and on about how he traveled through the universe and visited various galaxies and planets all over the place. And Rinpoche sat there very patiently, and at the end of this, he said, so Rinpoche, since I go travel through the universe this way, and what, would, what message would you like me to take to the whole universe and all the galaxies, the millions of galaxies in the universe? And Rinpoche said, cease to do evil, learn to do good, train your own mind. These are the Buddha's teachings. Wow. Thank you. One, two, three. <laughs> wow. Okay, with that, uh, we would like to take some questions from the audience. <laughs> now, the, the, rule, the rule number one is uh, make, your, make your question in a sentence. One sentence, okay? <laughs> the rule number two is not an Oscar Wilde sentence. <laughs> And the, the rule number three is don't finish the sentence with an exclamation. <laughs> okay. Don't give a speech. Try. Right. Do your best. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start by failing on all, all of those accounts. Um, my, I, I'd like to discuss the confluence between psychiatry and Buddhism, and it was really interesting that you used the metaphor of the private, private practice model and also the issue of a dana-based system moving into a fee-based system. Um, it, has, it has massive legal implications that when you, up until now, the dana-based system and Buddhism and Dharma has been protected under religious freedom. But when you start charging money for Dharma, you start, you initiate a legal contract that wasn't there before. And that means that you become legally responsible for the teachings that you give out. And one of the other things that's changed about the fa emerging face of Buddhism is that a lot of people are seeking teachings for psychological problems. Um, not, and, and a lot of teachers aren't actually trained to deal with that. And so this, all of this is converging into this really interesting situation where you're now, all of you, if you're charging, are now legally responsible for any kind of effects that, that meditation has on your students, and as a psychologist who takes the fallout from people who come off retreats um, uh, and have a wide range of, of very, very serious uh, situations, I think it's, I would really like to see this discussed um, more. So that's my non-question point ramble. Thank you. It's a good one. That was, that was yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Good one. Uh, the differentiation between uh, psychotherapy and spiritual practice is something that I've given quite a bit of thought to. I've actually organized three conferences on the subject mm. uh, in the uh, early 90s. And uh, it seems to me it's something that has to be revisited in every generation because it was very big in the late 80s, then it became very big again in the late 90s, mm -hmm. and then there's another resurgence of this. So it's something that I, I, I think it's going to a developmental model. I think mm -hmm. it's something that people grow up, they find that at a certain point they find the two are blending together or uh, they have a lot to say, and then they begin to differentiate them at a later stage of development possibly. Mm -hmm. That's a bit conjectural on my part. Uh, the, uh, for, in terms of the legal implications, uh, I've consulted with attorneys and so forth, uh, and accountants, uh, and we stay very much within the framework of uh, uh, religion, organized as a church and so forth. Uh, and uh, we're a little tricky with the wording sometimes, but I've, I've had very good advice from uh, mental health professionals as well as attorneys on this. And so we see uh, the work that we do 
within the uh, area of religion, uh, which is uh, an important distinction. The last point that you threw out at the end, I think, is vitally important, uh, that you picking up the pieces of, of people uh, doing retreats. Uh, and uh, it's been of considerable concern uh, of mine that people go to retreats and they have these intense experiences, high level of energy, high level of attention, and then uh, with very little transition, they go back into their lives. And one of the consequences of that is that as that high level of energy decays, unless there's a continued exercise of mindfulness, it goes straight into the patterns of reactivity. So people will often come back into their lives and for a few days be much more reactive and figure out what the hell happened. Uh, so when I teach retreats, I, I very, very careful not only to warn people about what is actually going to happen, but I build in a transition period. So if there's a three-week retreat, the last two days of that retreat will be a stepping down of the energy so that there is a smoother transition in, back into lives. And, I think, and some other communities have learned to do that, and I think it is vitally important uh, because things, really bad things can happen uh, if people are caught by that unaware. Before you two have anything to add, there's a useful cross-question, I believe. You were sitting next to me in one of the... To the mic, huh? Oh, you were sitting next to me in one of the breakout sessions, and you told a story about um, a, a student that came to you who wanted to take antidepressants, and, you know, you said, don't take antidepressants, um, and you had your reasons. Um, and I have no idea what your training is, but really, to make that decision, you need to have clinical training. Um, so that's what I'm talking about. I mean, well, it let, like, let's, let's clarify there. Yeah. This is a person I've known for a very long time. And her, what she was describing, I knew that. And I said, before you take antidepressants, consider this, this, and this, and this. And so I didn't say, don't take antidepressants, per se. I may have related that in the story. She's, she herself is a trained psychotherapist. And I said, and I ran through, and when she felt the congruence of what I was asked, talking about with her own experience, then she let go of any inclination to take antidepressants and, and actually settled into this transition that had taken place in her understanding. And she realized, you no, know, that would have been totally the wrong thing to do herself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a, yeah, just a couple quick things. My own... Uh, my own resolution to that issue is uh, that I, d I actually don't receive money for my Zen teaching. All the money goes straight to the to our nonprofit and is managed in that budget. And all my my livelihood I make outside of being a Zen teacher, unlike Shinzen. And um, but I, I want to say one thing is, as a as a long time meditator, using the integral map so that we look at the map in terms of you know, psychology, psychiatry, philosophy, um, phenomenology, that I've never had anything arise in my practice setting that I didn't feel equipped to handle or didn't have a support person pretty available that was able to help me handle it. And I do have the experience that sometimes people from psychology and psychiatry, they often approach me with a little bit of an energy that has a kind of quality of fear in it. And I hear a little bit of that in what you're asking also. Like there's this sense that something really dangerous is going to happen. And I think through my own experience, I'm, I'm really confident in, um, I guess in all of us, in terms of how we mutually support each other. And that I can call people who I know who are therapists and psychiatrists to get the kind of help that, that, that myself or my sangha needs, and they've always been extremely available. So I think there's a nice working relationship that we can develop with each other. So. Nothing? The, okay. the one other point. Uh, I screen people for retreats. And um, in one retreat, the people who were responsible for the screening didn't screen. We had it, all, it was all filled out the form. We ended up with a person in the retreat who was on medication, uh, and we had not been, uh, if I'd known about it in advance, I would have said no. Um, and because of the energy in the retreat, she started to fragment. Fortunately, my retreat manager was a trained psychotherapist, 
And basically, we built up a wall uh, and managed to create an environment for her so that she didn't fragment during the retreat. Uh, and uh, held it, just held it together, which I was greatly relieved, because when a person fragments in that environment, it's terribly destructive. Uh, and then went back to the organization and said, why didn't, you, why didn't you alert this? Because it was actually on the forms. So I think that one has to, you know, Shinzen talks about it being available to everybody, but people have to be able to use what are actually very high-powered methods. They can be used for healing, but when you get into the deeper levels of practice, they churn up very deep issues. And if people don't have a sufficient capacity of attention to meet those issues, it can be damaging them to, psycho to them psychologically. And I think it's very important that teachers have enough perspective to know how to recognize those situations and handle them in an appropriate way, which very often is to refer the people to a suitable, suitably trained therapist for that. And as Diane said, I've always had in my back pocket a couple of psychiatrists and a couple of uh, therapists whom I can turn to for support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, please. You try to. <laughs> um, in the area of paying for. Go closer. In the area of paying for uh, meditation advice or guidance, um, the, m the monetary model that we brought up, that you brought up earlier. I, was, I wanted to ask about, to, for more clarification on, for instance, you brought up the $50,000 per person for five days, and Shenzhen's talking about the availability to everyone. I was just curious about the, the interaction between those what look like very disparate um, events. How can someone charge $50,000 and, and make available to everyone the same, basically uh, available teaching or guidance? Mm -hmm. okay. Are you asking me? Or everyone? Yeah. Everyone. You should start. Okay. I should start. Everyone, but, yeah. <laughs> um, well, again, I think we have to ground the conversation in a context of just the incredible range of material wealth that there is in the world right now. And that uh, if a retreat that is at asking for a donation of $50,000 for a week appeals to a very, very, very exclusive and small number of people, and interestingly enough, they're willing to pay it. And at the same time, the workshop model that appeals to, to working professionals there's a certain price tag there, right? There's the price tag for students and for uh, maybe working class people, and there's a the price tag for people who are disabled or underprivileged, and that we're probably working with all of that in our practice. I haven't gone to that high-end exclusivity. It's just beyond my comfort zone. Um, but uh, it's a deep question. It's a deep koan to be lived because our relationship to money and our relationship to the energy of, of currency and of um, economic power is a, is a really, really deep one. So I think we just have to be realistic about what's happening in the world and then, you know, trial and error, see what well, works. Um, it's been my experience that people with a lot of money that pay a lot of money mm -hmm. expect to get more quality mm -hmm. for that money. Right. Some, uh, otherwise, why not? They, they're, uh, why not just go to the same workshop? Mm -hmm. So I think the issue, what he's asking is, was that money trickled down into making it vastly available to people, or did it stick in some intermediate realm and accrue to, you know, uh, there? Um, why are those people paying $50,000 for a program that someone else should be able to get for free. Mm -hmm. What's, there's got to be something they're paying for. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he's asking. Mm -hmm. Well, to go back to what Rohan was saying earlier, he wasn't, he's more interested in sustainability than free. And I thought that was a very important distinction. There's another distinction I would like to point out, and that is one isn't paying for the Dharma. I mean, whether you look at this from a medical point of view or from a religious point of view, you know, a teacher works with a student and 
their life is transformed. How much is that worth? Is it worth $100? Is it worth $1,000? Is it worth $10,000? Is it worth a million dollars? It's a ridiculous question because it is priceless in the true sense of the word that you cannot put a price on it. And what we're all talking about in the economic thing is not the value of the teachings or the value of what you get. What we're talking about is the mechanism by which people who are available, who are capable of helping and guiding others, can be available to help and guide others. And it's the economic system we're creating which makes it possible. So, Diane is put out this, where there is a couple of teachers who are comfortable charging very large amounts of money for a very select audience and then using that to fund their institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, what is wrong with that? What's the difference between that and royal patronage uh, that was a characteristic of the uh, medieval societies and so forth? There are people who are far more comfortable with a fee-for-service model than they are for a donation model because they know, okay, this is this is what the exchange is. They know exactly where they are. They don't have to figure out how much is this worth to me. Did, I, did the teacher produce the goods, <laughs> you know, uh, you say, because then there's a constant judgment going on. And they don't want to engage that because some days you're on and some days you're off. And they just want to know, okay, this is, this is the arrangement which makes it possible for, for Shinzen to teach. And so I, we're experimenting with these things. And I, th and I think that it's very, very good if there is a lot of experimentation rather than saying this is the right way or this is the wrong way. I pioneered a new model. It created more possibilities for other teachers. You pioneered the model. It created more possibilities. And the more possibilities that we create, the more access we're going to create with that. Okay, cool. That's cool. Cool. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi. Um, I notice I feel very uncomfortable asking this question, um, so bear with me. Um, but I guess I, I have some questions about um, Buddhisms and um, the emerging faces of Buddhisms. And I don't know how it is across the pond, but in the United States, there's so much diversity. Um, there's English language Buddhisms, and there's everything else. And I'm finding myself, um, I really appreciate everything I've heard this weekend, but I also, I notice that I don't relate to the face on stage. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those annoying like multiracial kids <laughs> and I grew up in poverty and I don't really relate to words like, you know, we experience this or most people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just, I'm curious maybe what your ideas are about some of the other emerging faces of Buddhism. Mm. Perfect. Yeah. So Thank glad you. you asked that. Yeah. Thank you. We were actually discussing this beforehand because yeah. in the LA area there are a th over a thousand temples. What is on the stage is an extraordinarily small part of the actual practice of Buddhism in America. There have been various attempts to bridge that gap. There are some people who have done it successfully. I'm thinking of uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu who is a Western teacher for an uh, Asian uh, community. I think that's extraordinary, uh, way beyond my skill level. And uh, so the, uh, as you say, one of these annoying Asians, <laughs> I, don't, I, think, I don't think it's annoying at all, I think it's wonderful because in many respects, uh, you're going to be in some way because uh, of what you bring from Asia and what you bring from growing up in this country, you're going to represent the fusion of this. How, mm -hmm. However, the, uh, and the many different possibles. And I'm so glad that you use the term Buddhisms. Uh, the first time I heard that was uh, with Michael Mead uh, back in 1993 or something, 91, when he said, one shouldn't think about the face of American Buddhism, and he purposely used the plural. And I think you're exactly right. Uh, because there is such diversity and such richness that has been developed in Buddhism over the years that the idea that it's going to be one thing is really counterproductive yeah. and encouraging a multiplicity of paths and things like that and along with that helping people find their way within that multiplicity I think that's really important 
So, yes, we've been discussing one or two aspects of it, uh, but what is going to happen, uh, one of the things we haven't discussed is the, the way that uh, Buddhism has changed in Asia with modernization. I don't know a lot of about it, but there have been huge changes. In some countries, there's been a revitalization uh, because of the Western influence, uh, in, uh, going, moving from lighting incest to being interested in awakening again. Uh, so that's, that's quite wonderful. So we've only been touched on a couple, a small number of the facets mm. of a multi-multi-faceted uh, jewel. Mm. From an ethnocentric perspective, I notice I feel a little bit defensive. From a world-centric perspective, I actually just feel curious and, and really quite open. And from a cosmic-centric perspective, it is one thing. It really is. Whether it's, call it Buddhist, call it whatever you want, but that recognition that there, there, we are one thing. We are one thing. And so depending on our context together, I'm going to respond to that really differently, but I appreciate the recognition of the difference and also you're just locating yourself in terms of the conversation. So, thank you. Oh, come on. You have probably the more experience. Uh, the, the silent sage? <laughs> no. <laughs> just, uh, this is He's a discussion. In, for that <laughs> <laughs> just try not to... Uh, <clears throat> blabber on and on, which is my tendency. <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs> I've got other things I want to blabber about okay. later on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question, please. Um, it seems to me that no matter what precautions you take and no matter who you consult with, it's only a matter of time before someone sues a Dharma teacher and wins, and that this will establish a legal precedent that's permanently going to alter the calculus between for example, the payment model and the Donna model. So if we accept that this is an inevitability, can we talk a little bit about how this changes our thinking about what models are sustainable going forwards? Well, thank you. Just create practice insurance. This Go is, ahead, is there something you want to blab about? Um, <laughs> yeah, blab away. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, um, I think that, but if you have a background in law, you can correct me. Um, but I think that um, uh, religious teachers, clergy, are open to suit also for um, uh, essentially the equivalent of malpractice. Is that correct? Mike's, Michael, he, this is my husband. He's a former chief justice, so speak. <laughs> He's empowered. <laughs> Here he comes. <laughs> Keep Actually, it short. I'm just, I'm just a <laughs> Dharma teacher. Um, yeah, there is clergy malpractice. And you can be sued, and I don't think the difference is between a Donna model. A little bit louder, huh? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think the difference is between a Donna model and a fee model. That has to do with tax issues, that has to do with other stuff, but you can be sued for clergy malpractice just as you can be sued for any other kind of malpractice. Lawyers don't, don't honor, it's a fir the First Amendment question is an entirely separate question than whether lawyers can figure out a way to sue you for holding yourself out to do something which you do incompetently. So it is possible that um, it really won't, have that much, uh, make that much difference, whether it's fee... Sure, I think the question becomes, what are you holding yourself out as? So if I'm a lawyer looking for a potential target, if... <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm, uh, the lawyer isn't usually the, well, let's be honest about it. Sometimes the lawyer is the one motivating it. Sometimes it's somebody else. People come to you all the time saying, I want to sue Google. I want to sue, name it. Can I sue Google? Well, that's you asking. <laughs> that, right? <laughs> the, Will that be good for Buddhist geeks? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, bad idea. Anyway, <laughs> it all depends on what you're casting yourself as. And an indicia 
of professionalization. Maybe you charge a large fee. Maybe you charge by the hour. Maybe you hold yourself out as blank. And I think that's what the woman was raising here. So if I'm gonna look at you and say, what are you holding yourself out as? I'm gonna look at the various indicia of the way you represent yourself, the way you comport yourself, and I'm gonna go then and try to analogize you to somebody who has liability for holding themselves out and not doing what they purport to do or not being qualified professionally to do what they say they're gonna do. And I'll look at licensing statutes to see if there are licenses that people who have those indicia should hold. Should we have malpractice insurance as Buddhist teachers? I do. You, have I li do. you sure have Absolutely. liability insurance. You and I have it. You know, I mean, uh, this is... <laughs> <laughs> so this is a totally separate question from a First Amendment issue and from a religious issue. Okay. This is offering yourself out as something and what do you look like and is it something that holds a license in, in this and country? And are you competent in terms of what you're doing? Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mike. Thank you. So uh, in terms of emergent face, one of the things we're going to see is uh, a different kind of professionalization of being a Buddhist teacher. And I want to say another facet of this teacher, because I was at the Garrison Conference recently, and basically we, we now have within the West Buddhist theologians, Buddhist teachers, Buddhist chaplains, Buddhist clinicians, as well as Buddhist teachers. And I think we need to get rid of this term, or at least break this term, teacher out into all of these different things because they're actually different professions mm -hmm. and they emphasize different aspects of Buddhist practice. And we have Buddhist priests, which is not exactly the same as a Buddhist right, teacher. Right. There's a lot of overlap in these things, but there really are differences and I think it, it, lumping them all together I think creates uh, problems and in, in, uh, in the expectations of, of people. But you go to a minister and a priest and a teacher and a clinician and a theologian for different things. Okay, now the, the, the question line is basically <laughs> closed now. Okay, we got just uh, three more people and let's try to, uh, to answer these questions uh, relatively uh, quick. There you go. So, um, the emerging face of Buddhism, I, I think, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, the emerging face of Buddhism, uh, it seems to me a bit that uh, we, we started out talking a couple days ago about Nick Dharma, right? And um, we started out this conversation today talking about um, the disappearance of the monastery as a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Not exactly. Um, okay, well, sorry if I misunderstood. <laughs> I'll just jump to the question. Um, with uh, is there is there as you see it an emerging face of depth of practice, an emergence of uh, the emerging heart of Buddhism or the emerging depth of practice? I mean, depth all, of, all practice. of you have depth. your relationships with your teachers and understand, you know, what happens when someone's in a monastery for quite a long time. Yeah, yeah. just to clarify, I said. That the spiritual direction is the last profession to leave the monastery. It doesn't mean the monasteries have disappeared. The doctors left the monasteries, the attorneys left the monasteries. The monasteries still continue in, all the, in many religious traditions. Um, the emergent depth of practice, oh yes, very definitely. Uh, this is going to be, uh, there are people, and we don't know where they are, we can call them the dark sangha, uh, who are devoting very the significant- dark sangha. <laughs> <laughs> That's a meme. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it, He's it, got it, the right it, voice for that, doesn't he? Yes, that kind of Eastern give credit European. Where credit to do. It, it, it originates you with better Josh. be careful with this bunch. It, 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 it originates with Josh Barron. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, the, uh, but there, there are people all through, because I run into them very occasionally, who are practicing in their lives. They aren't on any radar screen. There's tremendous depth in the practice. Sometimes they're living conventional lives. Sometimes they're living in uh, relatively re retreat situations. And they're quietly practicing and deepening and deepening and deepening. And they're, 
sometime or other, some of them are going to emerge. So I have very, very little concern about the depth of practice in American uh, or Western Buddhism. I'm, I, I'm just astonished at some of the, the sophistication, the levels of understanding that I run into in people, and I think it is just marvelous. Yeah. It's just not a question in my mind. Yeah. No, I would I really concur with that. That's uh, uh, my, <laughs> I'm very confident uh, of just generations of enlightened people arising. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, in general, uh, I suspect that if someone opens a website and says they've had enlightenment, most, most people are probably skeptical. But actually, I, I'm inclined to think they probably have. Yeah. Until I yeah. check it out and have some yeah. pretty strong evidence that they're not. Yeah, okay. My first thought is, oh, great, another one. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, this dude. <laughs> That's awesome. That's beautiful. I, I, I'd like to just say one thing. Um, I lost my father uh, in January. And... Um, I think I came to the path because death was so disconcerting to me as a young person and losing my dad. And uh, I've never been so grateful for my practice as I was during that time. It just allowed me to, to on the one hand, you know, all the experiences that a daughter has, losing someone that she, you know, that I, has just been such a support for me on the one hand. And to have the space and also just the, the trust, you know, in the process. I really, I just came away from the experience being so grateful that I'd been introduced to Buddha Dharma so many years ago. And, and being with people who also practice, it's just such a, a relief that you don't have to say anything and there you are in the same space together, so. Yeah. What is the price of the suffering that would have happened mm. that didn't? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Next question, please. Hokai, how much time is left? Uh, very little. <laughs> very little. Okay. In looking at the Two emerging minutes. space in yeah. Buddhism, do you guys I, have I any suggestions for working with teenagers and helping them? I'm struggling finding resources. Oh, Diane, Diane Winston is your resource. She's an expert in that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, thank you. See how easy that was? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, she, she, she's written a she's written a book on it, and there are several other people here who who, who have that. So just put that out to the group. I'm sure you'll find some resources right in this room. But Diane Winston, very definitely. There's also uh, inner kids. Yeah, that's for younger kids. Uh, oh, she good. was just yeah. going for teenagers. Okay. okay. Uh, last question, please. Hi, I'm Luke. Hi, um, Shinzen. You mentioned something. Very interesting. Closer to the, um, yeah. Since then, you mentioned the idea that people could teach each other even before they're, you know, they, they go through years and years of, of retreats and, you know, a, a monk tells you, okay, now you've reached whatever, whatever level. I'm very interested in that. Kenneth Folk and I have had some discussions about how to create a community where people can be teaching each other online or in person. I've been sharing everything I learned about meditation. I used to put it in a closet. Now I share it with people immediately, and many of them take to it right away. Even in a crowded nightclub, I can teach meditation for, for like yeah. for a minute, and someone goes, "I'm I'm feeling, I'm feeling, um, I'm actually feeling present. I'm feeling so much more relaxed than I was because bouncing around here and doing this. Where can I learn more of this? So that, that those are my experiences. I would love for you to share a bit more of that if you have time, or we could do that afterwards yeah. or for anyone else. Um, how, to, how to teach people to teach. Um. This is yeah, so emergent, I really don't have any specifics. Uh, Let's other, do a conference on that. <laughs> <laughs> other than to say, um, you experiment, and you find what works, and you, dis you may discover, um, contrary to uh, intuition, that people can actually teach much more quickly than you would have thought. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't... You can go to, his name is Soryu, S-O-R-Y-U, uh, Scott, um, and uh, you can see what he's doing, uh, or I can give you his contact, because mm -hmm. he has had much more experience in this uh, getting, and these are kids too, getting them to teach yeah. as soon. So he could give you specifics, and I can tell you how to contact him. Um, otherwise, I would just say experiment and see what goes with what works. 
And I would just add one thing to it, is if you're, if you're going to experiment it, with it, get really, really in touch of the, with the voice of the proselytizer. Okay, because <laughs> teaching and proselytizing have a slightly different quality. Very, very good right? uh, point to remember. And that's the one thing that we have to be careful of, because we get so enthusiastic that in the next moment, I, I'm going to teach you, you know, and it just becomes a kind of missionary zeal. And, you know, we just want to pay attention to the difference in the quality and how it's affecting the environment. I'd love to discuss that further after. Okay. okay. And I'm, go I'm going to add one more thing. Yeah. Uh, by all means, uh, as Shinzen has suggested, uh, experiment and also have a mentor yourself. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, before we, before we finish, uh, uh, Shinzen I has, one, has to have just <laughs> one last thing I want to say. Thing, uh, um, and he can compensate for the time spent being silent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that. Um, it, I started with a quote about uh, from H.G. Uh, Wells about uh, the spirit of history and in contact with science. Um, I know a major theme here was how does um, this whole global information um, culture um, change the Buddhist situation. Um, and I, in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, just a day ago, something sort of popped into my head that um, I'd never said or read uh, or written uh, any place. And I, th I just wanted to share it with the group, continuing on the theme of what history can tell us. Um, what history tells us about the Western world is that there was a development in classical antiquity. And then about 2,000 years ago, there was a really radical shift in direction. Uh, where a, um, a, a Middle Eastern um, system came in, uh, a modified form of Judaism, in my way of thinking, called Christianity, came in, and it just took over, uh, somewhat mixing with the past, somewhat abandoning certain elements in Judaism that were not universal, and also coming up with some really new things that hadn't existed in either of the traditions. And this, if, when you read the uh, early Christian writers, remember I said about being in on the ground floor, uh, you know, it's a good thing, like uh, quoting Tony Soprano. Well, if you read the <laughs> early Christian writers, the really early ones, you get this sense of, I can't believe that the world has changed this quickly. We who were nothing yesterday are now <clears throat> essentially running the show. Wow. And it happened in their lifetime and it happened really quickly. Wow. Um, and they were just dumbstruck. And uh, one of the things that made that possible, there were a lot of things that made that possible, and some of them I just mentioned, okay? Um, the pairing away of um, certain elements in Judaism that were not universal, uh, <clears throat> the mixing with the classical antiquity culture of the mystery religions and the philosophies, and then new things that no, neither of these cultures had had, those were certainly factors that made the whole Western world change in just uh, you know, a century or so. However, there is another factor that is often credited by historians uh, to the rapid spread of Christianity and the, and the changing. And that was that uh, the Hellenistic culture had a universal language that everyone learned, which was Koine Greek. And the New Testament is written in Koine Greek. It was the language that they all knew and therefore, it, could, it allowed for this message, this gospel, this good word, to just propagate to everyone in classical, uh, the classical world. And there may be a little bit of a parallel hmm. 
in this, now we've got this information age, okay? And where everyone has access to it, and it's sort of like koine on steroids. And we've got this good news for people. And that may... Are you, you know, a closet Christian? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I am... I like the idea of generalizing the, um, the, um, the myth of millennium. <laughs> I like to generalize that, and, and to see, okay. you know, that things could change quickly. So um, I just wanted to point that out as maybe a possible historical uh, significance to the information age and, and our gospel. Cool. So that's Very it. Cool. That's it? All right, guys. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.